Uh, there's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then Judges. I believe that's what, the seventh book in your Bible, seventh book in the Old Testament. Starting from the beginning there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then Judges. Then you'll find uh, chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Judges chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And uh, tonight my title is Choosing the Right Leaders. Choosing the Right Leaders. And uh, let's read this passage of Scripture. Go ahead and uh, stand when you find that. And uh, we'll read it. And uh, and she said, you know, 
And she said this to me. I never really said anything. She said, you know, we women are not really supposed to be the leaders. That's what she said to me. She goes, you know, well, we women are really not supposed to be the leaders. And she's talking about, like, in the government, Nancy Pelosi and all that kind of stuff that's going on. She brought that up to me. And she said, you know, uh, we women are really not supposed to be leaders. And, and, uh, and by the way, can I say this? Her husband did beat her into saying that. You know, a lot of people say, well, she's probably been suppressed and uh, basically brainwashed and all that kind of stuff. But no, her, her, her husband didn't beat her into saying that. And if anything, the Bible did. Now, the Bible doesn't beat you up, but the Bible will set you straight if you'll listen to it. And uh, so, so that's what I would say about that. Now, now that is not to say God will not use women. Please don't think I'm not. I'm saying that. I mean, when I think about Marge and and uh, the blessing she's been for our church, and the first thing I thought it's probably kind of selfish of me is to say, well, you know, we 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 get another lady who is helpful, who is an encouragement, who wants to serve, who wants to learn. Uh, and is excited about what she's learning in the Bible, and, and now she's gone. And uh, and so, so I'm, what I'm saying is, it's not to say that God will not use women, but they have a different use. Can I say that? And I and I thought about a, a, an illustration. It'd be like comparing a hammer to a screwdriver. What do you mean by that? Well, when you think about the uses of a hammer and a screwdriver. Now, you would have to agree that both have a purpose, but both have a different use. So if we can compare the same way with men and women. Both have a purpose, but both have different uses and are to be used differently. Yet, both can be forced when we're talking about uh, a man and a woman or a hammer and a screwdriver. Both can be forced to do the other's job. Think about it. You can take a screwdriver, and I've done it many times, to where I'm somewhere, uh, my job right now at Ferro Gas, um, I've got screwdrivers and, and I don't have a whole lot of hammers, but uh, uh, I've been uh, places to where I've had to take a, a, a screwdriver and take the handle of that screwdriver and beat on something uh, to, to knock it into place. Now, that's not the proper use of a screwdriver, but it's functional, it works, but, but it's not the proper use. I've also done the opposite where I had to use a hammer to knock the head off a screw when I didn't have a screwdriver. To where, to where what a screwdriver is meant to do, it's a little bit more finesse. Uh, you take the screw out, you put the screwdriver in the slot, and you back the screw out. But if you don't have a screwdriver, what you end up having to do is take a hammer and use it as a screwdriver. And so what you have to do is you pound the head of that screw till you knock the, the head of the screw off, and then you can open up or whatever you need to do to get that to get that open, that that screw, that that uh, that closure was on, you see. But what's amazing is both work, both are functional, both will accomplish, but sometimes what happens is when you use them like that, it causes damage to either the tool itself or to the object being worked on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there was some damage to that screwdriver. When I pounded something and moved it over, you do end up putting marks and nicks on that screwdriver, and you did some damage to the actual tool. Or when I took that hammer, I didn't hurt that hammer, but when I beat the head off that screw, uh, a lot of times it, it ruined the opening of where that screw was fastening, fastening whatever it was together, and usually what you end up having to do is forfeit where that screw was and put another screw in somewhere else, you see. And it did some damage to the object that I worked on. And, and so that's what I would say about pastors. So you're against women in leadership? No, I, I, you know, there's, there's a, when we go by the Bible, what I would say is, I choose to believe what the Bible says about leadership. And I choose to go about it the way the Bible goes about it. And so what we'll do is look at what the Bible says. And so what does, what does, um, what does God want us to see in this little chapter uh, tonight? What does it indicate to a nation here when I've had people say to me, well, you know, you're one of those churches, aren't you, that says that, that women have their place, and women can't do this, women can't do that, 
And, well, I just say, well, the Bible does say that there are certain situations where the man is, is the leader and the woman isn't. I'm sorry, that's just what the Bible says. And then they'll bring up a situation like, well, look at here. Deborah was uh, put in leadership. I'll say yes, but there's some things you got to notice about when uh, a lady is put into leadership in the Bible. God does go to women when men won't step up and take leadership. But it's, but it's not a, the sign of a healthy society. And that's what we'll look at tonight. And so what does it indicate? And uh, so what I want us to see, I'm not trying to beat our women into conforming. What I'm saying is the Bible says there's a certain way, and a, 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 a certain way leadership is done, and God has a certain perspective on how it's done. And let me tell you this, at the end, what I'm going to do is show you something that you ladies should be saying, you know what, that's right. Why would I want to take on that responsibility? You see. And so, let's start out with the first thing. What does, what does um, uh, lead, uh, women in areas of leadership where they are not encouraged to be, what does it indicate? Because I do believe there's areas that women are to lead in, and then there's areas that men are to lead in. Would you agree with that? I mean, you might say, well, I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. Show me what the Bible says. Okay, let's look at what, what the Bible shows us. First thing I would say is what does, what does it indicate when a lady or a woman is in an area of leadership that God says, no, a man should do that? What does it indicate? What's happening? Well, look at what the Bible says. We're in, we're in Judges chapter 4, and look at verse 4. Because I've had women, my wife was with me at the time, I've had women say, well, well what about Deborah? What about Deborah when she's leading in, in the Old Testament? What, you know, what's wrong with that? That's like God using that lady. Yes, it is. But then look at the scripture and look what it says. So look at verse 4 in, in uh, Judges chapter 4. And look what it says. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, she judged Israel at that time. Now, you would read that verse, many would read that verse and say, so? I mean, you know, God's using Deborah. And it says she's, she's a prophetess, and God's using her. But look at those, look at those three words. I got mine underlined, both. I got it in, in yellow, highlighted in yellow, and then underlined in red. At that time. And what you'll have to realize is the first thing that you can say to anybody is yes, there are times when God uh, turns to a woman to do leadership, and, and even in times when, when it said Dimmer, that's supposed to be a man's position, but what you'll find out is it didn't happen very often, and when it did happen, it, it was specific for a specific time. And it says here, at that time. Now, so what that would indicate is, okay, what do we do? Well, let's look at what it's talking about. When Just what does at that time signifies. Well, look back one chapter and look at verse 12 and look what it says. Chapter, Judges chapter 3 and verse 12 says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So here we go. We're determining the context of the scripture. And one of the, one of the time indicators is when it says at that time. You know what that's telling us? It's telling us that when you read the Bible and it says at that time, supposed, the first thing you're supposed to do is say, okay, when it says at that time, what is God trying to show us is going on at that time? So if you back up a chapter and you look at verse 12, it says, and the children of the Lord did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. Uh, verse 14 says, So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of uh, Moab, 18 years. Now let me ask you this. That time it's talking about right there, is that a good time for Israel? Are they enjoying their time? Is it a time of prosperity? Is it a time of spiritual growth? Is it a time where they're growing in their relationship with the Lord? Look at it. Think about it. No, they're, they're actually, it would be like, it would be like us. And I know everybody's, 
and, and I think we have uh, reason to fear, it would be like us coming under Islamic rule and Sharia law. Do you know what Sharia law is? Do you have any indication of what Sharia law is? Sharia law basically is going to dictate how you worship. Um, it's going to dictate three different things. How you worship and, and also um, how you practice your freedom and also uh, well, I can't think of the other one. Just like that. But anyway, Sharia law is not a good thing. And it is a it is a, a religion that is not centered on God. Matter of fact, it's a false God. It's a moon God. You study out Islamic religion, what you'll find out is they, they who they call Allah is not our God. Despite what my Harvard Baptist Bible College professor said. It is not, Allah is not the, the creator God. Allah is not our God. Allah was a moon god, if you study out the history of Islam. And so what I'm saying is, is just like what happened here where they came under the rule of some other king from some other nation, um, we're, we're at a threat, we're at a precipice in our nation where that could happen to us. And so when we read this, look at, look at verse 15. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, so in other words, they had no relationship with the Lord, but what happened is when, that, when judgment came upon them, and by the way, that's how God many times judges nations, is he'll turn another nation loose on a nation. And so what I would say with us is when we sit here and we see uh, it looks like Islam taking over our nation, we've got to wonder what's going on. You know, it might not be because we have a, a great relationship with God. It might be the complete opposite. It might be that our nation has gotten to the point where we have no relationship with God. Now, I'm not talking about our little churches like us who, who want to get, have a relationship with God, who want to read His Bible, who want to study it, who want to do what God says. I'm talking about a nation who, when they get to the point where you're probably 90, 95% non-Christian, even though you claim to be, and you have no relationship with God, that's where God's going to turn and God's going to say, if I'm going to bring them back to me, then all I'm going to have to do it is by putting a little whipping on their, their rear end. Whipping, you know, tan their hides. And sometimes that's how he does it. That's how he turns, uh, turns a nation back to himself, is what he does is he, 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 he'll use another nation to judge that nation and get that nation to turn back to him. He did it to Israel many times. Look at what verse 15 says. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up and delivered them. Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed by him, the children of Israel sent a present unto Abraham, the king of Moab. And so what we're looking at, and I know what you're saying now, but wait a minute, preacher. Ch Judges chapter 3 is a totally different time than Judges chapter 4. You're correct. But what we're seeing is a spiral that goes on in the life of Israel. You've heard, you've heard of me take, uh, talk about it many times. It's called the spiral of history that, that Israel went into. And by the way, I used to call it a circle of history that they went through, but it's not a circle. What it is, is a spiral. The history that Israel went through goes like this. To where God's right here, a circle of history would be like this. With God in the center. And they, they would spiral around God. And sometimes they would get away from God. But what's happening here is as they spiral down, they get farther and farther away from God. Kind of like this. And so yes, they might come back around to God, but they seem to get farther and farther away from Him every time. And so when we look here, what I'm showing you here is, is, is you might say, well, Judges 3, that's Judges 3. What about Judges 4? We want to look at the time of Judges 4. Well, that's why we look here. Because I want you to see something again. You remember the first verse that we read? Look what it says. And the children of Israel again did evil. Did you read that? So here's the time. At that time, here's the time that Deborah was used to judge Israel as a prophetess. It says that time was a time again of evil. 
That it says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Now, I not only showed you back in chapter 3 what brought them around to Ehud and how they got back away from God again and eat when Ehud died, but I brought you around to that to see something else. I want you to see that, that when God called Ehud, it was a different call than when he put on Deborah. What do you mean by that? Did he call Deborah at all? Well, look what happened. It says, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, uh, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host uh, was uh, Sisera, which dwelt in uh, Harasheth to the Gentiles. And the children of Israel, were in verse 3, chapter 4, and the children of Israel, just like what they did in the time of Ehud, where in verse uh, chapter 12, or uh, chapter uh, I'm sorry, chapter uh, fifth, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, it says, The children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and the Lord raised them up a deliverer. Here again it says, after Ehud died, that deliverer that he raised back there in chapter 3, here it says, when they got away from God again after Ehud died, it says, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Does it say the same thing that it said there in, in, uh, in uh, verse 15, where it says, The Lord raised them up a deliverer? No, when they cried unto to God this time, it says, And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lippidus, she judged Israel at that time. You never see a clear call of God saying, Deborah, now I want you to lead. Do you? You don't see that. And that's a very, that's, now, now the thing about Judges is when you go through the book of Judges, that's exactly why this book is called Judges. Because it's at the time when there was no king in Israel. And so God kept me calling judges to, to bring Israel out of their funk, so to speak. To bring Israel back to God. When they would cry out to God, God would say, okay, I'll put someone in charge of you. Here's a judge. He's going to tell you what to do. He's a man after my own heart. But what's amazing is in chapter 4 there, when Deborah was a prophetess, it doesn't say God called her. It says at that time, it says, and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lippitus, she judged Israel. It doesn't say anything about God called her. Do you see it? I don't see it. So he, you know, there is no call on Deborah as far as now. I'm not saying God didn't use her, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is, you don't see the same kind of call on Deborah that you see that God was putting on every judge in the book of Judges. And so what are you trying to get at here? Well, what I'm trying to tell you is she was a prophetess. And what is a prophetess? Well, um, just like a prophet, a prophetess is one that foretells future events. It's a person that, that, is, uh, that has been given an illumination has been inspired or instructed by God to announce future events. They're never chosen really to lead. When you look at, uh, when you look at every time a prophet was in the Bible, he was always sending a prophet to the nation's king. You understand that? Every time God would go to a prophet, he would use God as, yes, you're my spokesperson, but you're going to the leadership to tell them what I want to tell them. That's how God uses a prophet. That's how God uses a prophetess too. Now you got to wonder, why in the world was God using a prophetess here? Because apparently there was no prophet. Apparently this was a sin, sick society going on at that time. And so what are you trying to show us here, preacher? Well, uh, what I'm trying to show you is just like what the, our title implies tonight, uh, we need to learn... We need to realize when God shows us something that when it comes down to how do we choose right leadership in our nation, we need to go by what God says. Amen. Now, just like I said, oh, my pastor, he's against women. No, I'm not. Matter of fact, I'm more for women than most are. I'm for women who, who 
I am for protecting women. I am for uh, allowing women to do what they're intended to do. They have a specific purpose. And I'm not for throwing women out to the wolves. You see. And so what are you trying to show us? That first point I'm trying to show you that when, when you have the wrong leadership in place that opposed, uh, opposed to what God says proper leadership it should do, uh, should be, it indicates a spiritually dying or dead society. Spiritually. You see. And what Deborah was being used for, she wasn't called uh, to be a judge uh, as far as she wasn't called uh, to lead in the sense of how God was calling. She was the one that was there. God's going to use a woman if he has to. And so it says here, and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidus, she judged Israel at that time. You know what? I saw something interesting. Just uh, Christy and I were looking at some things. And I noticed, um, and I'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, that in the Senate and in the Congress, there was a time in the old days, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, that if a husband died in the Senate or in Congress, the wife took a lot of times his seat. Now, if I, I don't know if that was an honorary type thing. How, have you ever heard anything about that? I know you took political classes somewhat in Crown College and had a couple of professors that kind of went uh, on rabbit trails and took you guys and showed you some interesting stuff. I, I, I wonder if that was something that was practiced in our nation or what. But I noticed when I was looking for a, through a list, and you check this out yourself, Go through a list of, of the Senate and the, the Congress back in, the, uh, back in 39, 40, 41 during World War II and look at the years when uh, you can look at the list of who was serving and there was times where it would have the husband serving and if he passed away or if he was unable to carry through with his office, the wife took over. I thought that was strange. Same last name. So it had to be and it was always a woman's name. And they, but they never considered them some of the first women that served in the Senate or the Congress. It was like it was an honorary position that they took to cover for their husband. You see, I'll have to find out more about that. But anyway, what I'm saying here is a prophetess, if, if, if a prophetess was to be anything like a prophet was to be, it was one that foretold future events, a person who illuminated or who was illuminated, who was inspired or instructed by God to announce future events. And isn't that exactly what Deborah was doing? She looked, she, what I believe, you look at verse 6 in our text. And she sent and called Barak. Now this isn't Barack Obama. Blah. Make me one of Barak. I mean, we just, we went through eight years of probably the worst president we have ever had in our nation. And it will come out as that, historically. I promise you. When, you, when they look back at what took place, you're going to see some stuff that's going to be uncovered in the future. When you look back at what took place in our government, you are not going to believe what's going to go on. I, get, I, have, I have some information, and I don't know if it's true or not, that there is 130 indictments, or no, 130,000 indictments coming out that's coming out of all this investigation, not from the liberal side, coming from the, the, uh, the, uh, the other side, not the liberal side, not the wacko side that they're trying to impeach for no reason at all, trying to impeach for a phone call that they have a clear transcript of exactly what was said, and everybody says, nothing wrong with that phone call, and they're still trying to impeach, saying that that, that call, there was something wrong with it. And it's all a game, it's a charade that they're playing, or a charade. And what I'm saying is, but yet, what we're not seeing is these investigations that are being carried out by the Eternal Attorney General. From what I understand, there's going to be so many indictments coming out of that, it's, it's going to be unbelievable how dark our government is. Now, that's what I, whether it's true or not, that's what I've heard. And we'll just have to wait and see. But what I'm saying is, is when you look at verse 6, and you see it, it says, And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kedesh uh, Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded? And so she's going, what you have here is you have a, 
a, a prophet, in, the, in every sense of what a prophet does, who, who, has been, who has been foretold future event, has, has been personally illuminated by God himself, has been instructed by God to announce uh, a future event, and she's going and she's announcing that God is looking for leadership. You don't see God going, you don't see God saying to her what he said to Ehud, or what it says about Ehud, where it says, the, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a left-handed, and uh, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Ehud. What you see here is you see a prophetess seeking for leadership. That's what Deborah. So if anybody said to me, well, what about Deborah who was a leader? I'd say, you know, I, I believe she was a prophetess just like it says. And if you study out what a prophetess does, she was seeking leadership for God. She was telling the nation that we need some leaders. We need some men to step up and do what they're supposed to do. And, and the indication here is, is that when you look at her going to this Barak, he was about as wimpy as they could get. He did end up going and doing what he, she asked him to do, but he said, I'll only go if you'll go with me. So it kind of gives you an indication of, of what at that time was like. And just like I said, what it indicates, what's going on here, is, is if we really rely on the wrong leadership, it indicates a spiritually dying or dead society. And what I see here is I don't see God looking, I don't see God using Deborah as a leader, I see God using Deborah as a prophetess, as a prophet. And trying to tell that nation that this is what needs to be done. This is, you know, pick the right leadership and let's go. You see. And I tell you what, I think we're in the same kind of situation right now. I think what we're in is we're in a sin sick society that needs to learn how to pick right leadership. Amen. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a minute. Because what she did is she announced God looking for leadership. And that too even is an isolated incident. You just look at chapter 6 in verse 1. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of Midianites. The children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And what we see is the prophet, not the leader, we see there, we see there the only time that you see a prophet being called was there in chapter 4. But every other indication, you go to chapter 6 when they fell away again, then what he was doing was calling for a leader. Who is that leader in chapter 6, by the way? Anybody know? Yeah. There we go little Bibles named after him. Give him a give Bible. Or not the Bible, but the club, the uh, men's group that passes out these Bibles are named Gideons. You see. And when you know it's a man's call, from what I can tell. Amen. It's a man's ministry. Oh, their wives are beside him and whatnot. But it's, 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 is Gideon's led by men or not? Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder why, why they're not petitioning them. And I wonder why they're not you know, attacking them and all that. So, so here the prophet's not the leader, but, the, but a call for a leader. And so just as my point indicates, the reason Deborah moved to this position, because spiritually they were bankrupt at that time. So that's what it means, at that time. You go back to, to Judges chapter 4, and you look again where it says, it says there, uh, and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lepidoth, she judged Israel at that time. Time. Why was she judging Israel at that time? Because it was a sin-sick society. She was a prophetess that, that at that time God could not get any man to lead. And so she was put in there as a prophetess to speak for God and to tell them how they were a sick society. And she was seeking right leadership. And so it indicates a spiritual, when you have a woman in leadership like that, not, I'm not saying a woman can't lead. I'm saying 
there's, there's positions of leadership for both men and women. What we have to do is honor what God says about those positions and not, not co-mingle. It's what the Bible teaches. And so, and if we do co-mingle them, what ends up happening is it indicates a spiritually dying or dead society. Amen. Second point, verse 8 and 9. Look in our, look in our chapter, look at verse 8 and 9. Verse 8, it says, And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest, shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Gadesh. Would you agree that there's something? How would you say that? When you read that, wouldn't you agree that there's something that's shaming them men because it says that, that it, it says right there in that verse 9, it says, she says, and she said, I'll surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Wouldn't you agree that she's telling him that there's something wrong here? There's something wrong here with it with it being under the hand of a woman. Wouldn't you agree with that? When you look at that and say, there's something there that even Deborah herself says, go ahead, I'll go with you, but it's not going to be through your honor. It's not going to be the way God wants it. And it won't be in your honor. And a matter of fact, it'll be into the hand of a woman. Shame on you. We don't agree there's some shame there somewhere. Hey Amen. So that indicates something that says that something's out of kilter. So it indicates what I believe those verses right there indicates. It indicates a nation that will never reach spiritual maturity in that position. Oh, God will let it happen. You know, it's just like today. God will let what's happened to our nation happen. But there's not anybody that I talk to that we can go back to the 50s and say we've any way, shape, or form from the 30s, 40s, 50s, any way, shape, or form if we ever progress to get better. Our nation has, has steeply declined. Amen. Now, I know a lot of our young folks can't tell because they've been born into it. But I'm going to tell you what. I've been here around here long enough that, that I can tell that our nation's not getting better. And something's awry. Something's going on. <clears throat> and I believe what it is, is we are a spiritually sick society. We are a nation that is, has never achieved and is not anywhere near achieve, achieving spiritual maturity. You see. And can I say this? The biggest detriment to ever affect our society was when, and I know some are going to really raise their eyebrows when I say this, was when mothers at a time when needed as keepers of the home felt the need to work outside the home. And you know what? Nobody has anybody to blame but our nation, our leadership, our men's leadership, for causing that to happen. When did that take place? When did women really come out of the home and start, start you know, come out of the home? And well, what I, what Christy and I have noticed Chris and I have been getting a lot of books, or she's been going to the library and getting a lot of books about the Holocaust and World War II. And it seems that a precedent was set when we encouraged women to leave the home and help out in the factories during wartime. When you say that would be a detriment to our society, Miss Christine, you better say that. Well, if we get back home, we don't follow you. It's not that at all. She came to me and said that. Did you not? You came to me and said that. She said, you know, it really has really taken a turn and it has taken our society for a turn. Is when the World War, when World War II came and, and we encouraged our, our mothers to come out of the home instead of being keepers at home like the Bible teaches. And I'm not talking about staying home and making cookies. Like what? It wasn't a hill. Uh, was it Hillary that said that? When they, when they were, wasn't it Hillary that said that about baking cookies? Talking, making it, huh? Talking with disdain about. Yeah, she did, yeah, with disdain about staying home and baking cookies. There's more. Let me tell you what, woman. 
Ma'am, there's a lot more to a house than making cookies. I mean, there's a lot more involved at, at, with, a, with a woman who stays at home and raises children to just, than to just making cookies. And I'm going to tell you what, that's a slap in the face to women right there when she would say something like that. You know what that should make you women feel like? You know, she has no clue. And look at her family. Look at her husband. Whoa. That's disgusting. And look at the wake of death that has followed that family. I mean, you look at the people who have been, oh, it's just all conspiracy. Now, there's too many ties to the Clintons to see that that big wave of death that they have done. Anybody that's got close to her husband, he's been, they've been killed off, taken out. I mean, it's just crazy when you look at that. But to give that what I'm saying, when we see women taking areas of leadership that are contrary to what the Bible says, it indicates a nation that will never reach spiritual maturity. You see. And uh, right around that time, we noticed something. Christy and I, well, I, I kind of saw it. It was right around that time something happened that, that you guys would be familiar with. FDR. Anybody know who FDR is? You young ones, you know who FDR is? Ouch, you know who FDR is? You know what it stands for? Anybody? Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Wasn't he a president? And wasn't he the one that right around the time that we, we got bombed by Japan, that he made that, that famous speech? It was called the infamy speech. And you know what that speech was about? That speech he made, he made, he made before the both Senate and the House of Representatives, explaining something that happened on December, I believe it was December 7, 1941. Anybody know what happened then? Yeah, Pearl Harbor. Now, it, it might not sound like a big deal to you younger folks, but, but 20, I believe it was 24, 2800 people died. Because what the Japanese did is they snuck over on carriers and bombed us when we were not even in the war. We had never, we had never pronounced war against anybody at that time. And so we're sitting back, and what Japan did is to provoke us to come into the war, they snuck across and bombed Pearl Harbor. And not only killed our soldiers, but killed civilians. Some young girls, young kids, your age. Your, your guys, Paisley and, and Alex, your ages. Young girls sitting, you know, Sunday morning, going to church, and, and they came over and bombed and killed our people. Now, so what did Franklin Delano Roosevelt do? Well, it provoked us. And he was appealing. What he did is he made a, made a speech before the Senate and House of Representatives, and he was appealing to their resolve to allow the United States to wage war against Japan and its allies. I mean, anybody in the right mind would have said, this is war. We either sit here and let them do that, and they're going to come over and take us over, or we fight. That's the way anybody would have thought back then. Amen? And so what happens? The Senate votes. And I don't remember exactly what the vote, how many was in the Senate at the time. There was just under 100 senators. And they all unanimously voted to fight. The Congress voted. And it's, it's unheard of to get a unanimous vote. Nowadays, oh my goodness. But it's unheard of, even probably back then, to get a unanimous vote. But a hundred, uh, all the Senate said, we're going to war. So he goes, turns to the Congress. It's their turn to vote. And you know how the vote came out? There's 389 people in the, in the Congress. You know how the vote turned out? Anybody know? 388 to what, Christine? One. one. 388 to one. It's got to make you wonder. No, wait a minute. It sure seems like we had the result to go to war. Why did they end up being 388 to 1? Well, the one dissenter was Jeanette Rankin. She was the first woman to hold federal office. And, as, and, and wouldn't you know, she was a pacifist. You know what that means? She doesn't believe going to war. Kind of like what our liberals do today. They say they don't believe in going to war, but
But man, if you don't agree with them, they'll take your head off in a heartbeat. It's the same kind of mentality where somebody will follow someone and say, I was following someone who, who looked like they swerved their car with that turtle and almost hit them, and I got out and I took that turtle off the road, and if I could have caught them, I would have killed them. Because they were going to run over that little poor little turtle, and I'm, I'm such an animal activist, and uh, you know, I, if I could have caught them, I'd have ripped their head off and I'd have killed them. I, I don't get it. That's the mentality. And so, so that's kind of the mentality. I'm not saying all pacifists are like that. But I'm saying she was a pacifist from Montana. She was enthralled, by the way, how she got into government work is she was a, a, a guess what, Christine. That's what she was. One of your favorite people of all time, social worker. She was a social worker. And was a woman's rights activist. Never married. And I'm just telling you what, the, what, the, what it says, the bio, that the biographers disagree on her sexual orientation. She was never married, but she had a very good friend who was a woman author, who some say they had a relationship. Now, I'm not saying all that to say she was a, you know, the only dissenter in that vote was the only woman, in, the first woman to ever get into Congress, and she was a social, you know, she was a pacifist, she was a socialist, she was a woman's right activist, and she was a homosexual. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that's what they're saying. And she was in Congress twice. And was voted out both times. And somehow got voted back in or snuck back in, however you do it. She was in Congress twice and voted against World War I. Got basically voted out. And how long was it between World War I and World War II? Probably 25 years. And how somehow she got back in. And she was out of the state of Montana. Voted back in. Was in it for only two years because when she voted against them going to war, it says that she had to hide in a phone booth after that vote and, and ask for a police escort to get home. And she was promptly voted out of the Congress her next term. Now why is that? Well, I don't know. Maybe because she was in a position that she really shouldn't have been in. You see? And this may feel like a scathing rebuke against women. No, not at all. A woman is to be protected. Pull her, pull her out of the home and the system quickly crumbles. I mean, I don't think we realize how important our homes are. I don't think we realize that, man, we look at our bus kids and the, seat, the, the, parent, the kids that are coming out of broken homes now where there's not one dad in that home, and it's just a mess. And then I'll, I'll leave because, man, if we'd have just done it God's way, I wonder what a difference that would make. Amen. Yeah, but Deborah was a Deborah was a leader. Yeah, but look at the context. Look at what was going on. Yeah, I mean we can say the same thing today. Yeah, but we've got you know women have been in Congress for years. Look at the first one. Has it gotten any better? Amen. Has our nation gotten any stronger? So this takes me to my last point. So what are we to look for at times when a woman is leading? In the time of God, it was temporary, and men ended up rising to the occasion of moving back into leadership. And we can only hope we are in a society that will rise to the occasion. You see. And I think about this lady, who was a strong-willed, very artic articulate lady, standing out there, uh, standing out in front of a million dollar house that was that is their cottage. It's on Horsehead Lake. You know where Horsehead Lake is? Uh, it's right, it's, uh, it's uh, Horsehead Lake is out here in Macosta. Beautiful lake. And they're at the end of a private drive and that house has got to be a million. A million five. And they build it for a cottage. They live in Ransom. He is a, he's some kind of financier where he does investing for people and all that kind of stuff. 
I don't know. And I jokingly said to her, oh, you mean like the Jeffrey Epstein? She goes, believe it or not, she didn't even take, she didn't take offense in it. Because I almost thought, man, I should have said that. And she said, believe it or not, Jeffrey Epstein was nothing like that. He had a, he basically, it was a scam. Everything that he was involved in was a scam. He did not invest people in money. It was a scam. He ripped people off. She said, those that are in the in that business know that he had nothing to do with, with investments or anything like that. He was supposed to have. Now, her husband does. And apparently does very well. Because like I said, their cottage is about a million and a half dollars. It's about probably eight bedrooms. Looking at it, I mean, just unreal. You see. And I'm there as the lowly gas man putting gas in their, their underground tank, propane. And she had to step out. And I said, like I said, a very articulate woman. Not beaten down, not wearing burlap, you know, not, you know, not wearing a burlap dress down to her, her you know, and, and looking beat down, like, you know, I can't, you know, I better not come out. She, she even looked me in the eye. You know, it wasn't like she couldn't look at me because she's so beaten down by men no, not at all. And she said to me, and she's the one that said to me, you know, the problem with our nation is we got women where they're not supposed to be. You know, we got women trying to make decisions where they're not supposed to make decisions. And she even said it. The Bible says a woman's the weaker vessel. Don't <clears throat> say that. Yo, oh, that's what, another thing she said. She said, this, the sad thing is, she said the, the Marines are talking about, and this is all stuff I've heard. She was reiterating the stuff that I've been heard hearing from the guy that we're trying to do business with. And, and she, she reiterated a lot of stuff that he was telling me that I'm thinking, well, that's way out there. That the Marines are, re are recruiting right now and calling up Marines and calling me, uh, Marines out of the reserves. They're getting, she said, they're getting ready for something very big. Something's going on that when the, apparently when these indictments come down, there is going to be something like you wouldn't believe. As far as there's going to be so much criminal activity that they're, they're going to be having to protect the president and all kinds of stuff because they're going to expose stuff. It's, it's draining the swamp is what it is. And what she's doing is she said, but the problem is here. She said, if we have to call people, uh, men into the troops, and put men in the Navy, she said, or in the Marines. She said, who are we going to call? She said, now my son, she said, is a scrapping boy. He's been taught how to shoot a gun. She said, but my, my boy has friends at school to where they're afraid to touch guns. She said, they basically like, they, ooh, you know, I won't touch that. They're afraid of guns. She said, it's crazy. Basically what she's saying is it's almost like the girls in school today has switched roles with the boys. The boys are feminine. How many of you have seen that? Oh, I've seen it. Hey, man. I've seen it. And she was talking about how, you know, we've raised our boys and shoot guns. Now, we're not saying we're crazy. You know, we're, we're making him crazy or like that. But we're going to teach him how to defend himself. You know, and, and teach him that, hey, boys do this. You know, you, when, when a girl comes up to a mud puddle, you take that coat off and you throw it across that mud puddle. Let her walk across that coat. You know, you open that door for that girl. You know, of course, the problem is girls, they're, they're trying to teach girls not to reject them. You know, I am a woman, hear me roar. You're not to hold the door for me. I'm going to tell you what, that's a sick society. Amen. That's a sick society. Just like, let me get this right. The NFL is considered letting women into the NFL. Wow. What are, where have we gone? You know, because they talk about letting this woman be a kicker. What's going to happen is, what's going to happen if that person that got that ball after you kicked it breaks through everybody else's tackle? And here you are, I think she weighs about 145 pounds. Here you are, 
going to tackle a man who's coming at, what is, what is someone run? 20 mile an hour? 25 mile an hour? That weighs 215, 220 pounds. What do you think that's going to do to a woman that weighs 145 pounds? And ladies, I don't care what you say. Your bone density isn't like mine. Ain't no way. You're made different. Can't help it. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Amen. And so my last point is verse 6 and 7. Look what happened again. We'll back up in the scripture. It says in verse 6, And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh and of Tali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and, and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Tali, and of the children of uh, Zeglin, and I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, uh, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thy hand. I mean, what he's saying, it, it's not her that's going to do the draw. She's not going out there leading the army. She's going to draw this, this captain to this general in the army. No, it's God. She's speaking for God, and God is saying, I'll draw him. I'll, I'll, if you get it, if you go do what you're supposed to do, man, I'll deliver the enemy to you. In other words, God says, if you'll do it, I'll give it, I'll give you your enemy. You see. So my last point is this. A spiritually led woman, if you do find yourself in a situation to where, you know, when I look at the Bible, my preacher, my church, my God teaches me that really I'm not in a position I should be in. And so what 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 what, what I'm saying is this. A spiritually led woman who is leading finds herself leading, maybe in a position where she's not supposed to be, she'll be seeking a proper replacement. Amen. I think about Miriam. There's a time, and I know there's a time where Miriam and, and Moses' his older brother went against Moses. But there was a time before that when Miriam was an encouragement to Moses. She would go to Moses and encourage him and say, keep going, Moses. God's got you. God's got you doing, God's got your back. He's doing exactly what he says he'll do for you, Moses. Now, I know there was a time where Miriam and Aaron got jealous. And then they said, well, Moses can lead, any of us can lead. Nope. You know what Moses ended up doing? He gave Miriam leprosy. And Moses begged for it, her and said, don't kill her, God. And basically, Moses gave her, or God gave a woman one of the sternest rebukes in the Bible I've ever seen. He basically said, she deserves to have her face spit in. That's what it says. When you get a chance, I won't read it, we don't have time. Numbers 12, 1 through 16, read the account. God said, I'll heal her. She's going to stay out of the camp for seven days and know that she's done wrong. And then he basically says, you know, in our society, she has, she deserves to have her face spit. Oh. Man. So, question as we close. A woman in leadership in our time, is it a temporary condition or is it a sign of the times with our nation? from which we will never return. You know what we should be praying for? We should be praying, God, this is just temporary. God, we're praying that men will step up and take their place. And that they won't have to be in a position that, that they're not meant to be. And, and my last thought, just as I was walking over here, I thought, the last minute, just like mankind who submits to the authority of Jesus when they get saved, mankind, I'm talking men and women, you know, a lot of people don't understand. How do you, how do you call it liberating, liberating when you get saved? Because a lot of people think, well, now I brought myself under God's control. And they think that's so, you know, a lot of, a lot of society who are not godly, who are not spiritual, will look at that as, you know, I, I'm my own person. I don't need to be under anybody. 
But you know what? Someone that has a relationship with God, it's liberating. Why is that? Because you know what? I can let God make the decisions, the hard decisions. It's so liberating to realize that, you know what? I, don't, I no longer have to guess what's right and what's wrong. What's the right direction? All I need to do is go to God and say, God, show me. And when, I, and when I got to thinking about that, I thought, you know what? Why wouldn't a woman think that same way? Not about so much salvation, but when a, when a woman sits back and says, Lord, you put men in charge in a lot of these leadership positions. And, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit back and they're the ones that are responsible. It's liberating when you think about it. So the responsibility is on him. It's kind of like the fault. And what took place there. Did you know even after Eve fell, Adam was still blamed for it? Amen. Oh yeah, there's one thing where it says the woman was the weaker vessel. But really, you know who God blamed for the fall? Man. Mankind. Why is that? Because God went to man and told man, you're not to touch that tree. And you were supposed to convey that to her. And apparently you didn't do a very good job. Is what God was saying. Amazing. Amen. So can I say again? Last thing we need to think about. So, a woman in leadership in our time. Now, I'm not saying a woman can't lead. There are positions of leadership for women. And it's up to us to figure out which is, which is meant for men and which is meant for women. And so a woman in leadership in our time, uh, in, in areas of leadership that God says, no, that's for a man, is it a temporary condition or is it a sign of the times from which we will never return? Hmm. This is what we got to figure out. Amen. Father, we are so grateful, Lord. I pray you continue to bless us. And Lord, help us. And Lord, just as I said, I, I, I pray that no one thinks that I was here.